Well, let me tell you, I am nervous. <laughs> I knew that that would be the case. It's funny because, you know, you do this for seven years, teaching kids, and, and uh, it's a whole different thing when you stand up in front of a bunch of people who have just a wealth of knowledge, so many people that you could have come to to ask them questions um, while you were preparing this, and big parts of me are wishing that I would have. Um, <laughs> But we'll see how this all pans out. Uh, it should go good. But if it doesn't, <laughs> those of you that are visiting with us today, the guy that normally does this does really well. Um, and uh, sure sign of that is, is that he got me to stand up here today. So if you would, let's go ahead and go back to our scripture reading, which was uh, Revelation chapter 3. Verses 15 through 16. So I chose this verse, this scripture, because when I was a kid, this, this scripture scared me. Um, it was one that really made me question my faith when I was a kid, and mainly because I was a kid. It was a big part of it. Um, and it was because I was showing up in here every Sunday, I was coming in on Wednesday night. Many of you knew Joe. Joe used to pick me up, bring me into church. Um, and uh, I basically came in and I, I put on my Christian costume every, every Wednesday and every Sunday. And then when I left here, I went on and I did whatever I wanted to do. So let's take a look at the scripture. Starting in verse 15. I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Extremely powerful. So, to understand a little bit more about what the scripture is coming from, um, this was one of seven, seven letters written to seven churches. And this church, as you can tell, was one that was not falling under the, uh, the good version. And uh, so, so Christ uh, had John write these books, and this one came, went to basically uh, Laodicea, which was a city of wealth. So they had everything, right? We're talking about a city that was, that was built strong enough that um, when there was an earthquake, a major earthquake in 60 AD, they didn't request any help. They rebuilt the entire city themselves. So we're talking about a very, very rich, rich community. Um, because of that, We've all heard it's easier for a poor man to get into heaven than it would be for a rich man, right? Have we ever really considered what that means? Is it just because you're rich that it's hard to get into heaven? Or is it because of the temptations that are there for you because you are rich? Because you have everything. Because you, or you feel like you have everything, correct? Yeah. But in this case of this... The scripture we can see having everything in your hands and within your reach doesn't mean you have everything. There's one major thing that's missing. That's what the scripture is telling us, and at least it's what it speaks to me. Um, so, to kind of relate to this uh, scripture, I thought of some things that we do and we know of that. that could really uh, relate to it. So let's think about it like this. We uh, here in America, we are very about our sports teams, correct? Okay. Yep. So being lukewarm. This is like uh, the guy who every year has a different football team, and that different football team is the team that is winning, yeah. right? Yeah. Suddenly, all the Patriots fans come out of the woodwork this year. Okay? And next year, if 
the Packers go to the Super Bowl and they win, it'll be that way. And if the Cowboys do suddenly, well, guess what? <laughs> We're going to have the most fans again. Because there's a lot of people hiding behind, right? They, they don't want to admit when things are not going well. It's very easy to do that. Those of you who aren't into sports, we all know that guy at work who, when there's a big promotion on the line, well, that dude that usually walked in the door five minutes late, man, he's there 15 minutes early every single morning, right? He loves that job. But 90% of the year, he's not into that job. Doesn't care about it. It's basically, uh, it's like, uh, like having a uh, family member that, that is kind of pushed away throughout the family. But then as soon as that family member does something good, I always believed in him. He was the best. He was everything. Everything he ever did made, made right. And I knew he'd always be good, right? It's not being honest and true to what your beliefs are. So I wanted to uh, put this together with the title of are you the same man on Sunday morning as you were Saturday night? That song, or th this verse, it comes from a song actually. It's by a country singer, his name's Justin Moore. Okay? And he's singing about his grandfather. And he says in that song, he was the same man on Sunday morning as he was Saturday night. And man, that could resonate with me. Because I had a grandfather like that. He was the same man Sunday morning as he was Saturday night. And when he passed away, we took a strange sense of comfort in the fact that we knew exactly where he was. Because he was that. He was the same man on Saturday morning, Saturday night as he was Sunday morning. So how do we be that same man on Saturday night as we are Sunday morning? When you're doing good deeds, are you Seeking the, seeking the Lord with your heart? Or are you doing it to impress others? So, there are three things that I think that make us very consistent as a Christian. And three things that when I when I was putting this together, and I was thinking about those that I've really looked up to as role models in, within uh, Christianity and the Christian faith, three things that I saw them do pretty regularly. And they were reading His Word, sharing His Word with others, and prayer. Those are three things that are everywhere in here. I can tell you, finding Scripture for this was not difficult at all. Because everywhere I looked, it was there. So what am I talking about though? When, when I say reading His Word, I'm talking about the Bible. A lot of us, there are many of us in here that, that read Christian books. Okay, Those are called feel-good Christian books, right? They're not talking about the, the reality of, of what this totally covers. They are Christian books, and they are good books. But they are not the book. Um, when we're reading a book, it should address things like, like hell, like death, um, uh, consequences of our poor decisions. It should also talk about the consequences of our good decisions. It should talk about heaven. It should talk about the sacrifice made for us. Um, Sharing his word with others. Uh, you can be in the world, but not of it, right? Many of us, uh, we're coming in here on Sunday morning, and, and we look very Christian because we're sitting here, right? That's not to say we're not. But it's to say that, do the people in the world know that that's what you are? Personally, I can say, standing here in front of you, for me, that's about half true and half not. Okay? Something that I learned putting this together, and I think it was part of the reason Raymond put it together for me and made me do this, 
was because you really assess yourself as an individual when you stand up here and you're about to preach to a bunch of people. So don't think that anything I'm saying up here is directly uh, targeted towards anybody in here. It's actually targeted towards myself because I have this exact problems, all these problems that are in here. Those are me as well. Um, so you can be of the world. I mean, you can be of, in the world, but not of it. Uh, only God's opinion matters when it really comes down to it, right? If you are ashamed of him on earth, he will be ashamed of you in front of God the Father and the angels. We are commanded to go to make disciples. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, right? We are commanded to go. Which means that if we are being up in the world and not of it, we're able to tell people what we're doing, where we're going to be, why they should come on Sunday morning, why they should be a Christian, why they should be baptized. So going right down to prayer... Prayer is probably the first thing we do when we come to the Lord, right? We do it internally. It's one of the first things we do. Something's hurting. We're hurting inside. We're grieving. We're struggling. We want a new, we want a raise. We want a new car. Yeah. Right? Internally we pray. God, please let me do this. Please let me have this. And a lot of the time we try to, one of, one of the first things we do is we, we make compromises, right? Lord, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you. Lord already did for you. Um, it's wrong for us to make a compromise, but... Yet, I'm not going to say it's wrong for us to go in prayer because, once again, that's one of the first things we do. And it is commanded of us that we go to Him in prayer. But if we are just going to Him in prayer, we haven't gotten to know Him yet, have we? We're having a one-way conversation. I'm looking at my dad, and I'm saying, I want this, I want this, I want this. But I'm not listening for His answer. Those of us who have kids, we know that feeling. <laughs> and when we're kids, we don't understand it. We don't understand that the answer's already been given. If you have your Bibles real quick, go to John chapter 15, verse 7. Hey, Raymond, does the shaking ever stop? <laughs> Eventually. I should ask Haskell, too. He knows for sure. Okay, John chapter 15, verse 7. If you remain in me and my, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Once again... If you remain in me and my words remain in you. That's that one way conversation, right? He's telling us right there we must remain in him and his words must remain in us. Prayer alone is not enough. You're having a one way conversation. Basically, the TV's talking at you, and it can't hear what you're saying back. So, that scripture was written, this was uh, telling us that in, in Jesus' absence, that they were to, that the Holy Spirit was going to take his place, okay? So, everybody was so used to being able to talk to Jesus, and here he is. He's absent. But is he? Absolutely not. 
so that leads me straight into my next point, reading his word. Um, I'm going to go ahead and have you get there real quick. Go ahead and switch to Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. And we're going to go all the way through 11. This is a long one. Okay, so Matthew chapter four, chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. This is when uh, Jesus is tested in the wilderness. So it starts out, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, hold on, my pages are sticking together. He was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written. It is written. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. It is written. Okay? That's what I really wanted to focus on here is that it is written. Every answer you seek, whenever you are in prayer, it's written. I've come to know a lot of people over the years, and as soon as something happens after prayer, we immediately, it was a sign, so on and so forth. And there are signs. But the true answers are always right here for you. Your internal prayer is answered right here. Going on. Man, uh, sorry. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Once again, here we have it. It is written. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. So even Christ had to be tempted, correct? But we see right here through his trials, once again, he's referring to his Father's Word, right? It is written. Every answer you seek is written. So once again, I emphasize, as long as we are just going to the Lord in prayer, we're having a one-sided conversation. We're talking to the Lord, or we're talking at the Lord. We're not talking to the Lord. It's important for us to always reference, to find our answers. Because it's written. The last point I wanted to make is sharing God with others. So remember all the time, God sees all, right? Every single thing we do, every action, every thought, every wrong, every right. He knows what's in your heart. Simply walking into a church and putting on the show is not enough. I've been told I can clean up pretty good. Okay. I, I give that to my mom because she was very color coordinated. But he knows what's in my heart, right? I can sit here dressed as beautifully as I want to be. 
I can sit next to a beautiful wife every single time, and I can put on the show, but he knows what's in my heart. And if I'm sitting there silently, and at the end of the, end of the sermon, I've taken nothing away. He knows that, right? If I'm sitting there on my phone, Remember, everybody in here, it's not our job to judge you. There are only two people that can judge, and that's yourself. You can judge yourself internally and the Lord. That's it at the end of the day. We also uh, meet a lot of people in the world who are Christians, go to church, right? And that's one of the first things they say is, I'm a Christian. I go to church, right? And that's good. Nothing wrong with that. But should you have to tell somebody you're a Christian? Or should they be able to see it? They should be able to see it. Because you are in the world, not of it, correct? When you are serving and you're giving to others, are you giving to others because that is what He's commanded and because it's in your heart? Are you giving to others because you just feel like you have to? Is this something that strokes your ego? We see, uh, we see celebrities, all these people that so many of us want to look up to and, and there is this Oh, did you see he gave $6.2 million to the schools? Cool. Did he give that and not say anything? That's who I want to know. I want to know the guy who wrote that check anonymously. He didn't do it because he felt like everybody should know that he's giving. Let's be honest, 90% of the time that giving that they're doing is tax write-off. Okay. But the guy who's writing that check anonymously, I think he's probably given from the heart. Whenever we pass that collection plate around, right, we say don't let the left hand see what the right hand's doing, or vice versa. I got it right? All right. That's because it's not for anybody else to see. Nobody should know if I put in a nickel or a thousand dollars. It's nobody's business. It's between me and the Lord. Um, go ahead and go to Hebrews chapter 4, verses tw verse 12. This is a pretty short one. Verse 12, and we're going to go through 13. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. We've done the iron sharpens iron, right? Sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before his eyes for of him to whom we must give account. Meaning no matter what we're doing, God sees it. He knows what's in your heart. He knows if you're here for the right reasons. He knows if you want to grow in him. And he wants to have a relationship with you. I want to emphasize in here, it says that for the word of God is alive. It's alive. This is, we seem to think a lot of the time because this is very, very old, right? And it's not alive. It's ageless. It's timeless. It will never go away. It's active. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Nothing is hidden. Everything you do will be uncovered and laid 
before him. So in closing, I want to challenge you to identify your weaknesses. Where can you grow as a Christian? Pretend you're going to have to stand up here and give a sermon. <laughs> Pretend that everybody in here is going to go boo. I guarantee you, if you take that challenge, you will identify your weaknesses. If you open up your Bible and you read, you'll find your weaknesses. Quick internet search. Well, it can point you towards some scripture, which is really sweet. And it is nice for our day and time, right? If we want to find something, it is there for us, which is really nice. I realized that this second time around going to college. I'm like, wow, I wish it was like this the first time. Okay? It can point you towards the scripture, but without you actually reading the scripture, finding it, you won't know. If you're not sharing the word with others, you don't have any way to grow. It's huge. Telling somebody you're a Christian is one thing. Being able to help them when they need it is another. Being able to get them to come into church is another. I, I truly do give it up to people who stand up here every single day because they have the opportunity to assess themselves on a daily. They get to understand what it truly means to abide in this. And I don't want to put anybody on any pedestals. I just want to say that standing up here truly gives you that opportunity to assess yourself and assess your weaknesses. Are you being the same person on Saturday night as you are Sunday morning? Did you go out partying last night or did you stay at home and read his word? Did you share his word with your children last night? Did you pray with your children last night? Did you pray with your grandchildren last night? <laughs> pray with your parents last night? Last verse I want to reference is Corinthians 12, verse 9. And let's see if I even marked it. Of course I didn't. Uh, Corinthians 12, or 2 Corinthians 12, I'm sorry, verse 9. Wow, that probably would have been bad. Had nothing to do with anything, huh? Second Corinthians 12, verse 9. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's powers may rest on me. Amen. Identify your weaknesses. And I don't think you're going to have any problem with being lukewarm. Like I said, the man who normally does this is very, very good at it. However, if I said anything today that made you want to take a step in the right direction towards the Lord, if you would like to be baptized in Christ, please come forward. Or if we could pray for you for any reason, please come forward. As together we sing.